Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Sharma, and he's going to be speaking to us about the femoral approach and closure devices to reduce vascular complications. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Please join us. Welcome. Good afternoon. Hopefully everybody had a nice lunch. Uh, all right, so I'm uh, Raman Sharma, and uh, today we'll be talking about femoral access and how to avoid complications. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, they're trying to give my room away. Um, so, the as you know, as we start to do more and more cases, the radial volume is is, is going up. The femoral volume is uh, slowly going down, and this is you know we know that there is some good reason for that because there are a lot of studies that were showing that once you go with the radial axis, there is some difference, especially in the setting of, of a semis, as far as vascular complications, uh, bleeding, and even mortality. But there are a few studies that still show that, you know, in all comers, if you talk about every single uh, case that can actually uh, come to the actual table, there may not be as much of a difference as we're really talking about. So femoral axis and femoral, um, uh, you know, uh, femoral complications are still a thing that we have to discuss because around the world, people are still beginning femoral axis. Um, the good thing, though, is that the femoral axis complications are very rarely fatal, uh, but when they do happen, length of stays increase, hospital costs increase, and quality of life can be a real, a real issue, especially if there is a, a bad complication. So what are the complications that we're really talking about? Um, in general, the uh, overall reported incidences of all kinds of femoral complications are between 1 and 3%. We're talking about dissections with vessel occlusions, uh, perforations, uh, RP hemorrhage or hematoma, uh, and then others are hematomas that require transfusion or surgery, ones that don't really re require any intervention, um, are not really a part of what we will call an actual complication. Uh, there are projected numbers saying that small hematomas, like less than uh, two centimeters, happen in upwards of like 40 or 50 percent of the actual femoral axes, but those are not really complications. And then last would be, uh, you know, uh, pseudoaneurysms or AV fistulas. The RP hemorrhage and hematoma is in red because that's the one that can actually cause serious problems. Uh, and out of all these complications, the one that would actually result in a mortality is most likely to be an RP hemorrhage or hematoma. Uh, and the reason why this is also, it's, it's, this is actually the real problem is because it takes time for uh, people to actually become very symptomatic from an RP bleed. It's, you can take hours, you can have four or five liters of blood being lost in, in that cavity before people start to really become symptomatic. So very, very quickly, uh, not a lot of people here are actually getting access, but we'll talk about kind of what it is we're really looking for. So there is this imaginary line that's, uh, this, this, good. The pubic symphysis is over here, your anterior superior iliac spine is over here, and this little imaginary line is running along the inguinal ligament, and the most inferior margin of this vessel here is kind of what denotes that. And the reason why this is, this, this space is very important, because one is the retroperitoneal space, the other is the non retroperitoneal space, and these four centimeters of the CFA are where you really want to hit. Now, 80% of, 80, 85% of patients will have this bifurcation of your deep femoral artery, your profunda, and your superficial femoral artery happening below the third, the lower third of the common femoral head. So, the sweet spot is kind of like right around here. And there's like, you know, there's like lots of ways to kind of like teach people how to get access. I kind of like the way of where it's kind of this, this drawing. I do this last night. Uh, it's, I'm like kidding, I did not. Uh, you take two fingers, you kind of feel proximally uh, and distally. You, put your, you take your needle and go kind of between your two fingers. And this way, you know, like you're, you have, as long as you do things consistently, you're going to get good access. And you know, again, just knowing your radiographic landmarks, your anatomic landmarks, you can use your, um, you know, use your forceps to kind of mark the femoral head and all that stuff. And we can briefly talk about ultrasound here at this point. Uh, in our lab, we don't routinely use ultrasound. There is a lot of evidence that ultrasound guided access kind of prevents uh, some degree of complication. The problem is that if you don't use it often enough, the likelihood that you can have a high stick is actually pretty, uh, pretty high. So as you know, as you incorporate this into your practice, it's important to kind of keep that in mind. Uh, that ultrasound guided access, ultrasound guided access is an option. So this is a small example of a case that happened recently. Um, this is a case where you see that your initial stick uh, was in the lower third, but unfortunately for this guy, the actual bifurcation was above the um, 
was above the uh, lower third of the femoral head. So you appropriately took out your sheath and you got re-axis. But now, when you get your new axis, you created this nonsense, right? So at this point, what's happened is that you've created a dissection flap. You have this tiny little sliver of a true lumen, and then you have this entire thing where everything is actually gone. We actually ended up continuing with the actual case and going to do the entire intervention from the other side and in the hopes that this would maybe open up. Now, there's a reason why it's not unreasonable to say that you're just going to hope this is going to open up because you have to think about how this dissection actually happened and what the actual, um, uh, what the actual complication the and uh, the how the anatomy of the actual dissection happened but we came back we took a look and unfortunately same problem that the dissection flap is still there so then uh you end up getting some degree of vessel closure and you know the typical way that you kind of bail yourself out is you go up and over from the contralateral side gain access to the true lumen balloon and essentially you're you're fixed now this is a little bit of a different story <clears throat> Uh, this was a patient that was uh, getting a high-risk PCI with a impella, BAV, three-vessel rota, all the good stuff. And then this happened at the bottom during the closure. So the, uh, again, you know, so when people have perforations, there's a lot of blood, there's a big hematoma, and people start to get very, you know, get very uh, excited. Uh, remember, this does not typically result in a significant hemodynamic like collapse. So it's important to kind of just take your time and just realize that at the end of the day, manual hemostasis is actually something that works really, really well. So just take a pause, find out where the, where the bleed is. So taking a picture is very important. And then you just, again, same kind of concept, go up and over with the balloon, just tamponade, take a picture like you see here, make sure you're not seeing any more extra, extra avization. And then just, you know, you have to take into account the, uh, what the anticoagulation is, what is the, uh, you know, what can you reverse anything? If you can reverse anything, maybe you should. Uh, and then just wait. Uh, at, at, at the end of the day, uh, this is a problem that can be fixed with time and you have to just be patient. So uh, a few uh, basic uh, tips for anybody who is going to get, will be getting access. There is a necessity to manage the panis. Uh, so if there is a big panis in the way, you have to, when you get access and when you close, it should be in the same way. Make sure you position it out of the way. Use a stiff wire, a, a stiff catheter. And also, uh, you should also get into the habit of making sure that you're actually watching all your wires, catheters, sheaths, go through the actual access site all the way up the iliacs because that's where the problem really happens. Uh, I personally like it when the person who gets access is also the one who gets closure because then they know how far their needle went and they know how hard it was to push all the, the sheaths through. And that way they really know. And as this academic year is coming to a close, uh, the lack of comfort with a closure device should be very clear. You know, so you, if, you, if this is your first time doing a per-close, I would not recommend you do it on your own. Um, and there is a, a, for some reason, there is, is, is a shift to kind of say you're just going to routinely upsize your sheath. You have a six French sheath and you have an issue and then you're just going to upsize to a seven. Seven still bleeds and then you go to an eight and eight still bleeds. Yeah, that should not be the case. Um, you should. There are many other things you should be doing before you just routinely upsize the sheath. And at, at the end of the day, one of the most important things you can do to prevent this routine upsizing is to take a picture because you have to understand what's actually going on. This is Swiss cheese. And the reason why this is important is because at the end of the day, when you're getting, when you're getting your needle and you're going in, your panis is out of the way, you have aligned all these Swiss cheese holes, right? So the majority of the complications happen when the case is done and you're now planning to close and your Swiss cheese holes are not aligning anymore. So now you have this added level of resistance. And if you don't get this, if you don't do things in the same way as how you got access, you will 100% run into trouble when you're getting into, into closure. So it's, this is a concept that the fellows will hopefully by now really have you know, hammered in. Uh, and this is this Swiss cheese and it makes sense. Uh, we'll talk briefly about the, the most common closure devices that we use. We have Angioseal, Perclose, and the Vascade. Uh, these are the ones we're just going to talk about because these are the ones that are the most common that we use. Um, Angioseal uh, is a collagen plug-based device. The, so there are two collagen plug-based devices, and then there's a suture-based device, and this is the, one of the two collagen plug-based devices. So it comes with a, in a packet of three. There's an introducer sheath, an arteriotomy locator, and the actual closure device itself comes in a six French and an eight French size. And there is a bioabsorbable anchor that sits on the inside. That's actually, you can actually see it on, um, uh, on fluoro. 
and there's a collagen plug that takes about 30 to 60 days for it to fully dissolve. <clears throat> so when should you not use it? In a diseased vessel. And the most common complications are uh, you have extra vascular deployment, and that will result, you'll see that, you'll see frank bleeding, uh, you see a large lump forming, you can have just, you know, uh, a lot of blood actually. Uh, and the other would be that you have intravascular deployment. So it didn't go outside, it actually insides. And then what happens is that you have acute vessel closure uh, and eventually you develop a cold leg. So we'll briefly talk about how this, this device works. They very smartly wrote Angioseal over here, uh, not to market their product, but actually to help the person deploying know how far the arteriotomy is. So your catheter, your, uh, your, this is put in over the wire, uh, and then you see how far, once you take your, your actual um, arteriotomy locator here, you see how many letters of the Angioseal are actually being shown. So you know that when you deploy your actual plug, that's how far your, your sheaths should be. Then you go in with your actual plug device, go all the way in, and once you're at the same level, you pull everything up. It pulls this little bioabsorbable anchor up, exposes this little green little doohickey, and then you just push this down, and that pushes all the collagen down over here. Pretty straightforward. It works very, very well. Don't use it on a diseased vessel. Uh, Vascade is our other one. We use, we use it very commonly for all of our diagnostic cases. Uh, it's another collagen plug-based device. Very, very simple. It's a singular close, uh, closure device system. Comes in a five French. There's a six, seven, and the MVP, which is uh, up to a 12. And all that's left behind here for this, uh, for this uh, device is just a simple collagen plug. Uh, and again, don't use this in a diseased vessel. There's a theme here. Uh, common complications, which is the most common of all these, is that when you're pulling this whole device back, the whole thing comes out. But it's not that big of a deal. Uh, this is uh, pretty simple. Um, there is a, you put this right inside the sheath that you did all your procedures on, and you open up this little disc, this little night and all disc. They reinforced it about two years ago, so now it's a little bit stronger, so the whole thing does not just come all the way out. And then just two, three steps to, you know, to ex expose the collagen, push the collagen down, and then you close the disc, and then this little collagen that opens up, it activates all the local, you know, uh, thrombin uh, forming molecules, and then that collagen plug just dissolves on its own. Works very, very well. It's uh, the lowest learning curve, I would say. Contrary to the Perclose, this probably has the steepest learning curve. This is a suture-based closure device. Uh, there is two ways you can use it. You can use it with a single, Closure device for devices that are, uh, that's wrong. That's less than eight French. Uh, and then two devices that you would use for uh, sheets that are greater than eight French. Now, this is a very, very steep learning curve. This is not a very easy to use device, uh, but it's a very effective one. It actually gives you a nearly equivalent closure as you would do if you were to do a surgical closure. Uh, and again, you do not want to use this on a diseased vessel. So the most common complications are dissection and vessel closure, device failure, which is through the mechanism of suture uh, malfunction or suture, uh, suture just being broken. And there are a couple of ways how that can happen. And then operator failure, where there's an inadequate not deployment. We'll get into each of these briefly. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here, but this is just the first steps of the actual procedure. There's the rest of it we're not even going to really talk about. At the bottom over here is where the is where essentially the blood is going to be coming in, and there's a little anchor that you open up. And once you see the blood coming out from from the side port here, that means that your your actual anchor is in the actual vessel. Now, one of the main things that you have to do here is that once you go in with this device and you deploy the anchor, you pull up. Now, pulling up can result in two things: either you're you're coming all the way up to the anterior wall of the artery, or if you have gone too deep and you have deployed closer down to the bottom, you actually, when you pull up to the anterior part of the artery, you've also pulled the bottom part of the artery, creating a little dissection flap. So this idea of not going in too deep, not going too far, the same person who gets the access to the closure becomes really relevant here because if you see that you went in very, very deep with your, with your perclose device when you pulled back and you have your, your tension, but you're much deeper than you got the access, that means that there's a very good chance that you deployed your anchor up over here. And basically what happens is that your, as you pull your anchor up, you take your first lever up, that brings the, 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 two, uh, the one end of the sutures that are inside the actual vessel up, and then you push the, little, uh, the clicker down. 
that sends the two needle drivers that basically have to go end to end to the uh, to the sutures inside the actual arteriotomy. And then when you pull out, you're basically pulling out the end that was inside the actual artery. So this the the knot is formed once you actually have the the connection of your your uh, your needle drivers into the actual vessel wall. And then when you pull everything out, then you're exposed and your knot is somewhere in the middle and then you get to drive that down. So the operative failure is the inadequate knot deployment. And that comes down to making the, uh, the access site as open as possible so that we can actually get your actual access, your needle, uh, your, uh, sorry, your um, knot all the way down. So making sure that you have a relatively big incision so you can, your needle driver and your knot driver can go all the way down is very important. Uh, the suture malfunction can happen if you have a very diseased vessel, a very calcified vessel, which you probably shouldn't be using the device in any way, but should you choose to, if it, uh, the adventitial calcium can actually break the sutures, or if you push too hard, you can kind of misfire and you won't actually catch the actual uh, knots. Um, dissection we spoke about. Uh, this is very important. It's a very important concept. This is why taking a picture is very Im important. When you create a dissection flap, the direction of the flap is essentially how you fix it. All right, so an antegrade dissection, as in is going downwards towards the vessel wall, means that as the blood flow is going down, the blood flow will kind of push the flap this way. But a retrograde dissection, with the flap going this way, as the blood flow goes, it's going to also push it to the left. So one version of a dissection flap can potentially just be healed on its own because the, the antegrade blood flow will just close it. The other version of it won't. It'll actually close the vessel wall in entirely. So taking pictures is very important and understanding at what level this dissection flap happened is very important. A dissection flap happening during axis would result in a, uh, in a antegrade dissection. As your wire goes inside, it's going to catch the wall and you push up, make a little flap. That can be treated by just leaving it alone. But a retrograde dissection by pulling up the posterior wall with the per close, that's a little bit of a big problem. That can really close stuff. And this is a nice example of it. This is a young guy, 30 year old, going for some EP study. <clears throat> and eventually went home, said his, his foot felt really cold, uh, gets a duplex, and his CFA is entirely out. And you see that, whereas the first example, you saw, still saw a little bit of a, of a lumen. That's because it was an antegrade dissection. And this, the whole thing is gone, all of it. And unfortunately for this guy, no matter all the, you know, the different things that we tried to do for it, to do like thrombectomy me and ballooning, all that stuff, it did not work out very well for him. He had to go get a small uh, end arterectomy and it took maybe 20, 30 minutes, but a small patch and he was fixed. Um, so understand, understanding the mechanism of it is very important. So what do you do? You can, your bailouts are pretty simple. You have to, again, understand why this actually happened in the first place. So you can remove everything and just obtain some manual pressure make a consideration for a reversal of anticoagulation. If it is reasonable, a BAV is something that you have some anticoagulation on board, reversing it is not a problem at all. Quickly get your contralateral access and do some balloon tamponade. In the US, a use of a covered scent is, is considered a complication, not in Europe. Um, I think that you're, there's very few cases that actually really do require a covered stent. If that is what's on your mind, you should kind of, you know, uh, hopefully by that time you've called for some help. Surgery is your last option. Uh, it's uh, clearly, obviously, is a is a big complication, but it's it's one that will fix this uh, permanently. So, in summary, Swiss cheese. Um, make sure all the holes line up when you're getting your access and, and closing. Choose your closure device appropriately. Uh, another version, the takeaway of that is, don't use it if you think your vessel is too diseased. Uh, you should always be taking a picture, and that will help you understand the mechanism of failure. And then from there, you're able to kind of, you know, fix it. And last, just call for help. There's like 100 of us here. All right. That's it. Oh, any questions? Yes. Uh, so the question was, what covered stents would you want to use for a dissection? So I'll say for a dissection, you probably should not be doing any uh, covered stents. Uh, really, the only time you want to use any covered stent would be for an uncontrollable perforation. Um, and we have, on the lab, we have the, the Vibons BBXs. Uh, for this particular case, 
The most effective one uh, would be to do a balloon expandable covered stent. We don't like to use those in this high flexion area, but if you want to have uh, you know like a very durable seal, that would probably have to be the way, the way that you would have to go. Uh, but those are the ones that we would use. You have covered stents that are balloon expandable and self-expandable. Uh, the question just comes which one would, would, would be the best to use, and most often than not, it would be, have to be a, um, a covered stent that is balloon expandable. Thank you. Yes. Say it again. You just wait. <coughs> Seriously, yeah, yeah. So if you have a perf like that, that that, that perf that was done, that was done on on AngiMax. The uh, patient had some heparin allergy, uh, had like a multiple PCI, so the ACT was greater than four hundred. So you go up and over, and you put your balloon up, and you wait. You know, forty five minutes, an hour. Check your ACT. Pray that it's coming down. You mean the sutures for a preclose? Yeah. So, uh, maybe I'm not understanding here. Do you mean the 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 knot pushers and and all that stuff, or do you mean just just the actual sutures themselves? The tools. You want to keep them? Got it, got it, got it. Okay, okay. Um, just open up a new device. <laughs> it's easier. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, not everybody agrees on that. Uh, I think you can go, so yes, you can go on the same side. There's no question about that. The question is, can you go in at the exact same level as, as your actual uh, collagen plug? I personally think if it's within like a week or so, you probably should not. Uh, but within 30 days or even less, the, at that exact same puncture site, that same arteriotomy site should not be of, of any issue. No, you can use the same site. The only issue that you really have to just worry about is just angioseal. That's the only one because there's there's like there's actually something physically there, like a big piece of plastic. Yeah, everything else. If if you're in a if you're in a rush, just just go in. All right. Thank you very much.